For postwoman Edith Costi, life on Westry has changed in the quarter century since she arrived. She's still categorized as an incomer. It takes three generations here to be recognized as a true islander. I mean, I've been here nearly 25 years, and I can see a lot of difference uh, since I came here. The population is just about halved. Um, when I first came here on holiday, there was no electricity. It was just everybody had their own generators. And, and you didn't watch TV unless it was for the news at tea time. <laughs> so it was just a different different place. Um, the community was far stronger, I think, for um, people visited each other, whereas now it's the same. Nobody has time. Having been brought up in a forestry region on the Scottish mainland, Edith arrived on Westry only to discover there were virtually no trees at all due to the high winds. But while certain things may be lacking, it's more than made up for by the fresh air, traffic-free roads, the friendliness of the locals, and more important than anything else, the feeling of safety for her and her children. On this island, you just walk in the front doors. A lady phoned me the other day to offer me house insurance. And she asked me about the locks on the doors, and I said, oh, don't lock the doors. Oh, well, what about what kind of security do you have? What kind of window locks do you have? I says, I don't have locks in the windows. And she asked me a few times, hey, what kind of this and what kind of that? And I said, no, I live in a little island, there's no crime. She says, oh, I'm sorry, I can't insure you. <laughs> so, missed out on that one. Edith, like so many others, has to do more than one job to survive. In the evenings, she works as a home help for old folk, unable to fend for themselves. But it's another elderly islander who presented her with the opportunity to save an island tradition from extinction. Handed down from generation to generation, for hundreds of years, men like Jimmy Fergus have passed on the intricate skills needed to construct a Westry strawback chair. But none of today's youngsters seem to be interested. And with Jimmy well into his ninth decade, the artistry was in danger of disappearing forever. Jimmy is an uncle, actually, of, my, of one of my best friends. Um, so I've known him for a good lot of years. And he's, he's a wonderful character. When I went down there for him to, to teach me how to make the straw chairs, he was very, very patient and, and uh, never gave me a row. <laughs> and he's, he's quite a droll character. He says funny things without you actually realising until a bit later on that, oh, that was a joke. <laughs> but he's, he's really nice. It can take over a month to make a single chair, working from early morning until well into the night. And it seems like a relatively simple construction made out of wood, a few nails and straw. But the secret is in understanding exactly how tightly to pack each straw line. Get it wrong and the entire chair will collapse. Day after day after day, Edith would sit with Jimmy to learn the new craft. And just recently, Jimmy decided he wouldn't be taking any further orders. The responsibility of carrying on the tradition is now all down to his protege. So are you proud of your pupil then? <laughs> Do you think I'll ever be as good as you? Well, oh, yes, <laughs> yes, of course you can. <laughs> Oh dear. As far as I'm concerned, if they do it with the toll, that's all that's needed. I had no plan, I must admit, when I went to learn, I had no plan to, to take this up as a business. I mean, I just wanted to know how to make a chair. But then I could see that uh, it's obviously something that is, there is a demand for. for uh, I certainly get orders from all over the world. So it's certainly something that I think should be kept going. 
I'm hoping to, to start teaching some of the young, younger generation. I was supposed to stay for a day, but I stayed for five days and went back and then came back again. That was in November of 2000. I came back in the April of 2001. And I've been there ever since. When Paul Smeaton, a fisherman from the south of England, came to the island for a short visit, the lure of the peace and quiet and the people proved too much to resist. They're just fine people, and that's it. They're just fine people. Genuine people. I just wish I'd have found the place 30 years ago. It's been one or two um, white settlers, as they call the locals call us, you know, English. One or two have moved out and one or two have moved in. I say everybody knows everybody, as the same as they used to where I came from years ago. You could put £500 on your bicycle saddle on a Saturday, it'll be there this following Saturday. Unbelievable. Where it's down south, your bike will be gone. The mere mention of money is perhaps not the best idea Paul has had. Because if good humoured island banter is to be believed, the drinkers at the Pierwall Hotel would be pleased to see Paul produce just five pounds from his own pocket. This Englishman, despite the stereotype,